Hello everyone, my name is Wright Dobbs and I'm a meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Tallahassee. So today uh, for this week's educational outreach video, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, what is in, in my opinion, most meteorologists opinion, the most useful tool in our meteorologist toolbox and that is the Doppler radar. So you can see in the background the Doppler radar here is pictured. Um, so let's go and uh, let's start talking about Doppler radar. Alrighty, so as I said earlier in the beginning, uh, Doppler radar is, is one of many tools in a meteorologist toolbox. Um, one of uh, briefly, we'll go through some of the tools here in the meteorologist toolbox. Most of the the primary the primary important tool is observation. So we're looking at radar sensors, basically temperature sensors, wind sensors, uh, weather balloons, which measure all the the atmospheric conditions throughout the entire atmosphere, and a certain kind of observation is you, and that is weather spotters. Um, another tool in our meteorologist toolbox is computers, and we use these for forecasting. Uh, computers help generate the weather models that are a big part in our forecasting abilities. Um, we use computers to communicate our weather message and computers help us do the math that's important in meteorology and, and, and important in weather models. And, and most important, and another important uh, toolbox is uh, experience. And we get as, as, as more and more, uh, as we go through more and more weather events as a meteorologist, that experience grows and we become much more, we become much more efficient, we get to recognize more patterns and, and our abilities as a meteorologist grows. So what's the most, why is observation the most important of, of these tools in our toolbox? Well, observation is the first step towards predicting the weather. Uh, good luck trying to predict the future if you can't tell what's going on right now. So basically, you know, being able, being able to know what's going on now is key to figure out what's going to happen in the future. And some of this observational data goes into computer models, and that's a big first step in, in the computer models getting the correct forecast. Uh, we've seen plenty of times where, um, e even lately maybe, the, the computer model performance has gone down a little bit lately with the loss of airplane flights uh, due, to the less de due, due to the decreased demand. And we've seen that model performance has gone down just a little bit as all this airplane data is not able to get into the models. So, um, and, and lastly, an observation is important because it tells us if our forecast is correct. So going to, uh, er, going, now going into what radar is, um, the most important tool in our toolbox, radar stands for radio, azimuth, direction, and ranging. And the primary purpose of a weather radar is used to monitor the atmosphere for precipitation, but it can also be, also be used to measure other phenomena. Um, the cool thing about the radar that is one of the most important things for meteorologists is that it can also be used to measure wind speeds, also known as velocity. And we do this through an effect called the Doppler effect, and we're going to go into a little bit more details on what this is a little bit later. Recent developments in Doppler radar technology have also allowed us to determine things like precipitation type. Uh, we can even see if there are birds in the air, so there's smoke from fires, or and, and many other more and many applications. So let's go into a brief, uh, brief history of the Doppler radar. Doppler radar had its origins uh, from World War II, and basically when, when, uh, when aviation community and, 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 um, and folks in the Air Force would use Doppler radar to monitor for enemy planes, they would always notice that precipitation would interrupt the, this ability to see the enemy planes. And once they noticed this, they started being they started using what the radar would see to their advantage and and to make forecasts and, and stuff like that. Initially, technology limitations slowed the radar deployments across the United States. But as technology as electronics technology expanded greatly in the 60s, it eventually led to what's called the WSR 74, which was the first which was the first of many or or was many radars installed at National Weather Service offices across the United States. Uh, and as technology grew and the importance of radar and, and meteorological community grew further and funding was increased, the WSR-88 was developed and that is still the modern day radar that you see on your phones and that many meteorologists, including us here at the National Weather Service in Tallahassee, use. So this is what the early radar imagery looked like for a lot of meteor National Weather Service meteorologists. You know, it wasn't a whole lot of detail and the cool thing about these early radars was the the meteorologists could control which way the radar beam was pointing so whenever they saw storms of interest they would just point the radar at it at the workstation and look at it and determine if a warning needed to be issued 
Um, and, this, and this technology continued with the WSR-74, but as the WSR-88 imagery came out, uh, the meteorologists could no longer control which way the, the, radio, the radio dish was pointed, but the radio dish worked a lot more efficiently nowadays, so that, tech, that, that use isn't, much, isn't really uh, needed nowadays. So here's what some of the imagery looked like uh, in, in the mid-90s to, to as late as 2008. Uh, as we um, as we improve, this was a super this was a group of storms out um, out in the plains uh, a few a few years ago. This was back in 2003. But as we as we know nowadays, radar technology has gotten much better. Here's WSR88 imagery in what's called the super resolution era. So you can see on the left, this was what WSR88 imagery looked like before the resolution upgrade, and after that, look how much easier you can see the tornado in this in this image. You know, you can see a somewhat in the top left image here, you can see a resemblance of a hook. But as you look in the top right, that hook is very, very evident. And not only is the reflectivity data, which is on the top, improved, but also the velocity data on the bottom is much improved as well. Here's, here's an outline of the Doppler radar coverage across the United States. So this graph, uh, this image right here is showing where there's radar coverage below 10,000 feet. So why do we talk? Why is 10,000 feet an important, important uh, altitude to talk about? Well, that's something we're going to get into a little bit later. But one thing I want to point out here is look at, at some parts of the United States where you see the white on the map, or maybe even a little bit of the blue in some parts of the eastern United States. That's where there's no radar coverage below 10,000 feet, and sometimes this can give trouble for meteorologists trying to give uh, give adequate warnings. Um, my first example, which I'll go ahead and, and, and talk about a little bit later, is uh, my first tornado warning uh, was a little bit late because my first tor uh, tornado warning as a meteorologist the National Weather Service was late because the lowest radar beam of the storm I was looking at was 25,000 feet, and it was very there was no circulation evident beneath the thunderstorm that I had a severe thunderstorm warning for. Um, but thanks to weather spotters, another tool in a, in a meteorologist toolkit, the weather spotters informed us of a tornado on the ground, we were able to get that severe thunderstorm warning upgraded to a tornado warning. And then, and that was in a place called Baker, Montana, which you can see here out in this graph, eastern Montana has very poor radar coverage. So generally, uh, there's around 155 weather radars in the United States, and for the most part, there's excellent coverage. So now to the, the, more, the interesting part, how does a Doppler radar work? Well, and Doppler radar works by one, it sends a pulse of energy out. And as that pulse of energy flies out, you can see it in the image below, it strikes off a particle. It could be, it could be any kind of particle. It could be a building, it could be a raindrop, it could be hail, it could even be de debris from a tornado in the air. But basically that radar beam hits the particle and some of that energy is reflected back to the radar dish. This return pulse is what converted to a signal that meteorologists call reflectivity. And another cool thing is that we're going to go into the Doppler effect. It helps determine how fast and which direction this particle is moving. Now, recent developments over the last decade can help us determine precipita precipitation type, if there's birds, smoke, and a whole lot more. So here's what it looks like inside a, <clears throat> inside a radar dome. The radar dish fits very comfortably inside the dome. There's no room up there. You definitely don't want to be in there when it's spinning. Not only not only might not get hit by the dish, but this beam is uh, sending out a lot of energy uh, right there. So you don't want to be in there when it's, it's operating and spinning. So continue on how a Doppler radar works. Well, a meteorologist needs to know, it sends the beam at, 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 sends the beam at a half degree angle. And not only that, what, as it rotates 360 degrees. But meteorologists need to know what's happening not only at the surface, but we also need to know what's happening uh, above the surface in the middle parts of the cloud, maybe even the top parts of the cloud. So the radar beam tilts upward and it scans multiple what we call elevations to get a complete picture of the storm. You can see this here in the graphic on, on the left. You see how there's a scan on the bottom and then there's also scans that go higher up. Now these things, um, the, a full scan to get the whole storm uh, from a 360 degree uh, perspective can take as short as four minutes or sometimes as long as 10 minutes. Uh, but that depends kind of what kind of uh, severe weather operations we're in. Generally, when we're in severe weather operations here at the National Weather Service, we're trying to get scan times as short as we can. But 
when where stuff like snow or maybe there's light rain, generally we'll, we'll, the scan times are a little bit longer so we can get a little bit more detail in, in, in storms. So as I, I was mentioning earlier, unfortunately, as the radar beam goes further away, because, it, as, as, because the lowest uh, tilt is 0.5 degrees, it, the, highest, the, low, the higher the lower scan is, the less we can see. And sometimes this can lead to missed warnings. So not only does the radar beam, the radar beam tilts up as we go further away because not only does the, the radar beam pointed at half degree elevation, but the earth is also curving away from the radar beam. So that causes the radar beam, as you can see the image on the right, going up into the higher parts of the storm as you go further away. And sometimes this can cause you to miss more. You can see as the radar beam is closer to the storm in the left, it's getting the middle of the storm. But as it goes further to the right, that same storm, we're only getting the top of it. So that's some, that can lead to mis-warning sometimes and, and difficulties in what we're looking at. This is an excellent image showing how a radar scans multiple elevations. It, as you can see here, this is the cross-section of, uh, of a radar scanning a tornadic supercell. You can see how as you, go, as you go to the higher parts of the storm, you can see how the tilts grow and grow and angle. So that's, um, we need to know what the whole storm is doing. And that, one thing I want to show, out, show here is um, there's some really high reflectivity aloft in this storm, maybe around 10 to 20,000 feet. If you're just looking at the lowest scan, uh, you're not going to know what's happening up there. And that could be a precursor to very strong winds. It could be a precursor to giant hail about to fall out from the storm. Those are things that meteorologists need to know so we can give you more advanced warning. So here's the example of a delayed warning I was talking about earlier. With, so in my first experience as issuing a tornado warning in, in the National Weather Service was actually, the tornado was already on the ground before I had the warning out. And one of the reasons for this is the process which helped form this tornado occurred in the lowest couple of thousand feet. So when I was the radar operator and I was looking at this storm, there was no circulation that was evident from the data I was looking at because the lowest scan that I was, that had available to me was approximately 25,000 feet off the ground. So the, the radar did not even see this tornado. Thankfully, we had a, there was a weather spotter who happened to be a National Weather Service employee. He saw this tornado. He also saw that there was not a tornado warning on it. And he called our office and he informed us of the tornado and that led to me immediately upgrading severe thunderstorm warning to a tornado warning. So one thing that has revolutionized, revolutionized how meteorologists can look at these storms is what's called sails. So remember I said that a lot of the processes which help form tornadoes occur in the lowest couple thousands of feet of the atmosphere? Well, sails is a new way uh, developed, uh, developed in the uh, late 2000s that helped us get more rapid lower level scans. So um, these extra low, low level scans occur roughly every 140 seconds. But new, new additions to sales in the last few years have given, have given us the ability to get three sales cuts. So what does this mean? Well, this means that we can get the lowest level scans potentially as fast as every 75 to 90 seconds. This is important as every minute counts when we're looking at storms. And we need that next, we need that next piece of velocity data. We need that next piece of reflectivity to know what's going on at the lowest levels to potentially give more lead time for tornadoes. And that's what, what sales does is it goes through its normal scan of, of the whole storm, but as it starts to go up a little bit, it says, okay, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna go back down to the lowest level, I'm gonna scan it, and it scans the storm 360 degrees, and then it goes back and continues the volume scan. And then as it's continuing the scan, it comes back down to the lower levels and says, all right, we're gonna scan the low levels again. And this happens every 75 to 90 seconds at the highest sales cuts. So this gives us a lot more weather data to look at, and this can help us give more lead time on tornado warnings. Alrighty, so now that I talked about how the radar works, let's go into what the Doppler effect is. This is what this is uh, this is what gives us the ability to see tornadoes. This is what gives us the ability to, uh, to see how fast the winds are in a severe thunderstorm warning. So basically, rain particles that are traveling towards or away from the radar affect the frequency of, that, of the pulse that comes back to the radar. So the radar beam's gonna shoot a piece of energy out, it hits the raindrop, it hits the particle, but that particle's moving, and what the radar does is because the frequency of the pulse 
coming back is different than the pulse that went out, we can do some calculations on that and figure out what the speed was relative towards relative to the radar. So we can see if how we can see how much of that uh, that speed is coming towards the radar and how much that speed is going away from the radar. So one cool example of this, and I'm going to go go through it right here, is the sea breeze that we saw just yesterday when I was uh, when I was putting some of this together. So here we go. If we see this, uh, you can see the increased reflectivity from places like Sopchoppy to Crawfordville and, and other parts of southern Wakulla, Wakulla County and Florida. So basically the sea breeze is, is a rush of air coming inland. So from um, basically this sea breeze is, is a south wind coming off the water. So remember what I said in, in the last graphic, green is indicated uh, is indicating particles that are coming towards the radar and red is indicating particles that are going away from the radar. So if we look at the Tallahassee observation, the winds are coming out of the out of the west northwest, and they're going to this uh, the east southeast. So if with if that's what the wind direction is, we would expect green to be towards the radar and red to be away from the radar. So we should see green on the left side of the image and red on the right side of the image. And you can see that here on the right, we can see this. Reds are over here, greens are over here, and that aligns with the wind direction. But the sea breeze coming is, is showing us something different. You see these greens are going against the, the flow that's at Tallahassee. Well, that's because, as I said earlier, the winds are coming from the south. So the winds right here are going to be coming towards the radar in, in places like southern Wakulla County. And one thing is the Doppler radar can't measure winds that are going perpendicular to the radar. So if we look here with the shape of the coastline, you see these grays? That's where the wind is estimated to be moving perpendicular to the radar's beam. So that right here, the radar is right here, pretty much right in Tallahassee, and the wind's moving perpendicular to the beam right here. So it's moving southwest to northeast, and it's gonna be, it's not gonna be able to measure anything because the way those particles are traveling, they're not going to the radar. So it can't measure velocity if they're not going to the radar. So we can see that, that's why some of these gray areas are. So how do meteorologists use the Doppler effect? Well, we use it to tell where a tornado is. Looking at the reflectivity image here, it's hard to quickly tell where the tornado is in this example. However, we know when we were looking, when we were in warning operations, we noticed the greens and the reds right next to each other, and we were able. This indicated that there was a there was probable tor uh, rotation, and there was a tornado likely on the ground. So this this is when National Weather Service meteorologists issued a tornado, and you can see that right here. We see the green next to the red. Green is coming towards the radar, red is going away from the radar, and those circulations are packed extremely close to each other. And that's one thing we really are looking for. You can see here, there's greens and reds next to each other all over the place, but here they are very tight, and also the velocities, pretty much the colors of these images, are very bright, which indicates very high velocities, which is what you would expect in a tornado. So uh, now that we've kind of shown um, what a tornado warning looks like and, and how the Doppler effect helped us. Let's go into real quick how we issue a warning here at the National Weather Service. So during severe weather operations, forecasters are constantly monitoring the latest radar data. We're looking at reflectivity, we're looking at velocity, we're looking at a whole bunch of things. And um, for this, a good example would be for this last storm, meteorologists identified an area of, of circulation and usually we're looking at storms the whole time. We already have these these warning boxes drawn up, and I'll get, I'll get more, get into more information on what a warning box is. We have these boxes drawn up, and we're looking at these storms. So now that we, meteorologists have identified a dangerous storm, we load up this program called WarnGen, and now we're going to pretend to issue a tornado warning. So we're going to choose the warning type. Meteorologists select, well, we see a storm that's potentially producing a tornado, so we're going to go ahead and select tornado warning. After we do that, a little icon will appear on the screen. You can kind of see it right here. What, what we do is we then be, we calculate the motion of the storm by dragging an icon to where the storm is now. We go back a few scans and see where the storm was, and we make sure the motion that we've estimated is correct. Once we've estimate, once the motion, uh, once we've the motion we've calculated is deemed correct, we draw this polygon right here, and we and we edit the polygon. You see it's got little triangles on it. We can edit this polygon to find it to alert make sure people that we think are at risk from this storm get alerted and we can make this polygon all kinds of weird and crazy shapes but we do it mostly we, we try to keep it consistent and 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 warn as few people as possible so 
uh, we don't have a false alarm. You know, we don't. You, no one wants to get a warning and, and not have any, not get anything. So uh, we try to limit this polygon, and we try to do the best to make it uh, to alert those that are going to be impacted. Once we're happy with the polygon, we're happy with the motion of the storm. Uh, we go ahead and are going to go to the next step. After that, we then calculate how long we expect the warning to be out for. Uh, we want uh, for this one, we're going to expect we're going to say. 30 minutes. This tornado, most tornado warnings are for 30 minutes, but some can be longer, especially in the more dangerous tornadoes where we have more confidence of the threat. After we select the duration, we're going to say why we're warning on this storm. We can see here there's things like Doppler radar indicated. We see a squall line with embedded tornadoes. Uh, there's actually been a tornado that's been found. Uh, weather spotters reported tornado, stuff like that. We also have the ability to add certain um, precautionary statements and additional information that's not pictured here. After we've selected all the bases for warnings, the additional reports, um, and the hazards that this storm is expected to bring, we go ahead and we'll click create text. And when we create the text, you can see this text pops up here and we'll go through and we edit all the information really quick. Most of the information is already pre-formatted and doesn't need to be edited on our end. But we do need to make sure that the storm motion we calculated is correct, the warning, uh, the warning makes sense, uh, people can read it, we make sure there's no spelling errors. Basically, we QC the warning real fast and um, right here in this information, like for this, for this warning, it says at 10.55 p.m., this was actually thunderstorms uh, that happened a lot, uh, just a few days ago. Um, we just edit to add any additional information. Uh, and then usually this process from identifying a storm to generating the text and clicking the send button to send it out to the world takes as little as 60 seconds. Uh, and we're able to go that fast because a lot of the time meteorologists have the warning boxes already drawn and we're just waiting for the storm to get to a certain level to issue the warning. So we've become very quick at getting this done. And as soon as we send the warning, the emergency alert system is activated. If you get, uh, if you, I'm sure you've seen your phone blow up for a tornado warning when we've issued one. And that's something that's, that's coming from our office. And that's, uh, as soon as we do that, click the send button, all the alerts go out and the emergency alert system is activated. So basically this is what the whole process looks like uh, on our screens as we're getting things ready to go. You can see the box here, the motion, and then also the, the, on the left side, the warn gen uh, selection where we select the hazards and, and, and then create text and get ready to send the warning out. This uh, tool also allows us to issue warnings for other offices should they, have, uh, should they go down. All right, the last thing I'll talk about here with the Doppler radar is what's called the dual polarization revolution. So this was relatively new date. This is relatively new that uh, came back came back out in the, um, in, in came out at least a, a little bit under a decade ago. And this revolutionized National Weather Service warning services. And one of the cool things that dual polarization did is it expanded the observation abilities of our radar systems. And it, and it, in addition, it has helped reduce false alarms from warnings. So basically what dual polarization is, is a normal radar on the top image only, only sends out a horizontal pulse. So we see the pulse goes out, it comes back down, and it's only horizontally oriented. But with dual pole, not only do we send a horizontal pulse now, but we also send a ver vertically oriented pulse. And what this does, in the next, I'll show here in the next graphic, this helps us determine not only the size of a particle we're measuring, which, which could be done in, with the, only the horizontal poles. But now, because we have the vertical pulse, we can actually determine the shape of something. So you can see here in this graphic on the top right, hail and rain have very different shapes when they're in the atmosphere. Hail is more circular, it's more uniform, but rain, as it's falling through a cloud, it's more spread out than it is, than it is deep. So the radar can now, with the dual pole, Revolution, it can see these shapes, and basically, um, because of those added that added ability, we've we've been able to add extra products to our radar. And one of the most important that we'll talk about here is correlation coefficient. And there's other things like specific differential phase and differential reflectivity. We're not going to get into those today; they're a little complicated. But we just want to briefly talk about correlation coefficient and how meteorologists and the Weather Service use that. 
So cor correlation coefficient, one of its one of its most important uses um, is for tornadoes. So we can see here. This is actually this is actually a, a, an image of the tornado that struck southern Mississippi last week during the during the large outbreak. So correlation coefficient basically it measures how similar the vertical and the horizontal pulse behave between radar pulses. So as I said earlier, radar pulse, radar works by sending a pulse out, but it sends many pulses per second. And what we're what we're doing is with the correlation coefficient, we're seeing how if the vertical and the horizontal pulse behave the same way between these pulses. If they do, if they do behave rather rather similarly, the correlation coefficient will be high. So we see that means see all these red areas here. That means what the what what the radar beam is measuring is is pretty uniform. And so here there's probably a whole bunch of rain and it's all uniform. Um, maybe in, and sometimes in, in the atmosphere when uh, in the winter it will be all snow. But for this case, why it's useful for meteorologists is you see this deep area of blues right here. They're they're corresponding right by this very very strong circulation. This was actually a very large and dangerous tornado. And we see this correlation coefficient that was that um, was coinciding with these strong velocities. And what that meant is that meant that that tornado was likely picking up debris and and throwing it in the air. And the radar was picking up that debris. And this is what we call a tornado debris signature. One thing that was apparent too with this tornado is: Do you see all these lower co uh, these correlation coefficients, these blues and yellows? The tornado was so strong, it was picking up all this debris and the very strong winds in the atmosphere were throwing this debris and it was actually beginning to fall out of the sky north of the tornado. And we can see all of that, the radar was sensitive enough to pick that up. And basically a lot of meteorologists nowadays, we, we will put out a tornado warning and if we start to see this, this thing, what's called a tornado debris signature, if it's co-located with the velocity couplet like this, we're likely up we're likely issuing an update to our warning to say we've confirmed the tornado it's been radar confirmed and in fact this was a radar confirmed tornado and not only that but many spotters on the ground were seeing this tornado so this was that this was later upgraded to a t become a tornado emergency because this was a very large and destructive tornado but correlation coefficient was a very important tool because it gave us confirmation that a tornado was occurring Lastly, uh, not why it's not related to a tornado. One cool thing of the correlation coefficient, one of many uses uh, that that uh, that we can talk about, is what's called the melting layer. So basically, below the melting layer, all all the clouds contain. If there's rain in the area, all the clouds are going to contain water droplets. We're not really expecting any snow. But as you get higher up in the atmosphere and things get colder you start to get a mix of rain and snow. So this area that's a mix of rain and snow is this little ring around the radar. So the cool thing about this is this is what's, this correlation coefficient helps us find what's called the melting layer. So remember how I said, how I said raindrops are flatter, but snow is kind of, is more uniform, uh, like the flake is round and stuff like that. So we can see this melting layer and one important thing about the melting layer is if meteorologists, meteorologists are trying to figure out where the freezing layer is, it can be very important for determining what type of precipitation is occurring. So say a computer model says the melting layer is at a certain height, and we use the radar and we determine that the computer model is wrong. Well, our forecast could potentially be wrong, and we need to update folks uh, of the increased potential for snow or other haz winter hazards like that. So that, that's another uh, important thing, and going back to my earlier point at the start of this presentation, why observation is important. Why observation is the meteorologist's most important tool in our toolbox. And that's what one thing correlation coefficient can do. So lastly, uh, I'm just going to want to say thank you guys for stopping by. And this is, uh, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the comments here. And we're gonna, we'll, we can try to answer some of them offline. Uh, we are going to be in a very busy weather pattern the next day or two, so it could be a while before we get to your comments. But feel free to put some comments in, in, the, um, in the comment section, and we'll try to get back to those and answer any questions you may have. And again, students, thank you for tuning in, and we hope, uh, hope uh, you've learned something today. And thank you for tuning in.